All right, hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Google Plus Hangout. Uh, my name is Cody Schweitzer. I'm a web editor here at the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Uh, I'll be your moderator today. So we have a great hour ahead as we talk about how to get celebrities involved in your cause. And this is a bit of an experiment, so bear with us. This is the first time we've had a couple of people in-house um, in the studio. So uh, let me start by introducing the people we have here in the library with me. Um, first, Spike Mendelson is a celebrity chef whose restaurants include Good Stuff Eatery, We the Pizza, and Bernays here in DC. He's been on numerous TV shows, including as a contestant on Top Chef, and has helped charities such as Care, Horton's Kids, and DC Central Kitchen. He's the author of The Good Stuff Cookbook. Uh, also with us here is Stephanie Chen, who is the Policy Communications Manager at Care, the Global Poverty Fighting Group. She works on Care's Learning Tours program, an effort to educate members of Congress and other decision makers about international development through Care Sponsored Travel. Thanks to both of you for coming in today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And uh, joining us via Hangout is Tamar Cohen Simpson, uh, Director of Celebrity Relations and Partnerships for the U.S. Fund for UNICEF. She spent seven years at ID Public Relations as a senior publicist in the talent department, representing some of the most famous names in Hollywood. Thanks for joining us, Tamar. Thanks for having me. Also online is Colleen Wormsley. Uh, marketing associate at DoSomething.org. She manages public relations and helps secure celebrity support for DoSomething.org's national cause campaigns that encourage young people to take action on causes they're passionate about. Glad you could be here, Colleen. Thanks for having me. Okay, so before we begin, a few small housekeeping items. You have a few ways to ask questions today. If you're watching this on philanthropy.com, you can simply comment in the chat box you see on the page. Not the comments, but the uh, box that says Chronicle Live Discussion. And you can also send us a Twitter message using the hashtag PhilChat. If you're checking my phone, it's because I'm looking at your questions, not my email. Uh, so everything's OK there. Uh, also, if you'd like to review a recording of this discussion, it will be available immediately on this page, as well as on our Google Plus and YouTube pages. Uh, so let's get going. So Stephanie, tell me a little bit about what you're doing and how you got involved with Spike. Sure. So I work on policy communications for CARE, and we have this really Neat program where we try to bring influentials, policymakers, journalists, celebrities overseas to see our work firsthand. And the goal is to make them become champions for the advocacy work that we do. So, one of our big priorities is ensuring that women and girls and families around the world have access to um, food and nutrition. And food and nutrition security makes up a big component of our advocacy portfolio. So, it made sense as we were thinking about who would be a thought leader in the area of food, we looked at some of the celebrity chefs in D.C. And we saw that Spike was doing a lot of great work with local charities, and he had shown a commitment to um, sustainability and buying local, and it aligned really well with our advocacy objectives. So it sort of made sense to get a bunch of chefs together and just try this trip to Peru and see how um, a lot of our programs aligned with their own values and principles around food. So Spike, what was your reaction kind of when you were approached by CARE? Um, you know, first of all, it was an honor to be approached by CARE and have the opportunity to, to travel to Peru uh, as one of my first trips. Um, you know, for me, it, it, the relationship totally makes sense because you know, as chefs, we're kind of at the forefront of, of food policy. Um, you know, it's our business, it's our practice, literally, our, our, you know, our career and our profession. So, um, you know, being able uh, to lend a hand uh, and uh, you know, develop awareness and actually get on the ground and do some groundwork, uh, you know, where food policy is, is a very important part of it. And, and I think, you know, as chefs, we can be leaders in, the, in, the, in this in this department. So, for me, it's, it's a great opportunity. Oh, great. And uh, Tamar, can you talk a little bit about your work and how you um, reach out to celebrities and kind of what you're doing there at UNICEF? Sure. So thanks for having me, everybody. I'm excited to be here with all of you. Um, a little bit about our program. It started way back in the 50s with Stan Kay, and then Audrey Hepburn, Audrey Hepburn followed in, her, in his footsteps, and UNICEF pioneered really the the way that we work with celebrities today. Um, we have an international ambassador program and then a national ambassador program for the United States and other industrialized nations. I run the uh, program in the US. We engage celebrities from 
various fields, um, leaders in their fields, including television, film, music, sports, beyond sports. Um, we work with a lot of chefs. Um, we work with um, a lot of influentials. We work with tastemakers, on-air media talent, and we really speak to what their interests are. And we're lucky at UNICEF to serve children in a variety of ways. UNICEF works in 190 countries around the world. We are on the ground, and so we are serving them, you know, in healthcare, in immunizations, nutrition, water and sanitation, emergency relief. So there's a lot of celebrities um, who, for instance, say, you know, I'm interested in trafficking, and so we have uh, child protection programs on the ground, and we really introduce them to our work so that they're aligned with our mission. It really, we, we have a variety of ways that our celebrities get involved with us, anything from advocacy campaigns, fundra fundraising initiatives, spell events, um, certainly in emergencies, whether they're natural um, or man-made uh, situations, we really it's about amplifying our mission, and it's always about inserting children into the cause. This is, you know, we are an organization that serves children. We are a leader, um, and so it's really important that we are hearing what our celebrities want to do for us, and that we really tailor make programs around them so that they are advocating for our work, and of course, helping us raise dollars, which is ultimately the goal here to serve children. Great, thanks. And Colleen, can you explain a little bit about your work doing? Definitely. Um, so do something.org is the largest not-for-profit in the U.S. for young people ages 13 to 25 in social change. Um, so we actually have, we were kind of founded um, in pop culture because Andrew Shu, who is an actor on Melrose Place, um, actually started Do Something over 20 years ago. And so it's kind of in our roots that we've been working with celebrities since we've been founded. Um, so since we're an organization that really focuses on young people, what's unique about Do Something is that we're always trying to find talent that's really relevant to young people and that they care about and that they have fandoms around. Um, so we work with celebrities in a couple different ways. Um, we run national campaigns around different causes that young people care about, whether it's the environment, bullying, homelessness, any cause that the young people care about. Um, and we film celebrity public service announcements which are, which are distributed um, in schools and in uh, movie theaters and shown all across the country. Um, we also work with celebrities to do different social media activations to get young people involved, um, attend events, and really be ambassadors for something. Great, thanks. Uh, and so I guess the, the first question I have before we uh, take questions from the group is how do you kind of identify the people that you want to work with to start? And so um, I know that it has to be mission. How do you kind of vet and approach a celebrity? Colleen, if you want to start? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think with Do Something, we're kind of in a unique position where it's not like we're focused around a specific cause. We kind of have a whole range of causes that we focus on. So it's really finding, A, celebrities that are passionate about the campaign that we're running. If, you know, if teen homelessness is something that's a passion point, that's kind of one of the most important things. Also, for Do Something, um, relevance. So, you know, Young people have such a different idea of what celebrities are right now than, you know, 20 years ago. With YouTube, with social media, there's so much more of an intimate connection um, with young people and celebrities. So we kind of try to focus on working with celebrities who have a tribe or a fandom that, you know, if they tell their fans to go out and donate jeans at their local um, Aeropostale to help homeless teenagers, that they're going to go out and do it. Um, so we look for, you know, celebrities with passion, celebrities with a tribe, and celebrities who young people are really care about. And Tamar, how do you kind of select an approach? Um, our approach is fairly proactive. It's we have a lot, like I mentioned, we have an international program, and then we have national programs in the UK, Australia, uh, Japan, Korea, etc. And so we usually um, focus on celebrities that we know have. A sort of a passion for working with children. Um, usually, you know, sometimes they come to us and sometimes we really vet them out, but we're very careful because our program 
you know, there is an official title as an ambassador that you could receive. It's a very prestigious title. Then we have a lot of supporters. So we have a huge network of celebrities that do various things for us. And because of that, we're, we're usually talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, meeting with celebrities themselves at, at our events. We are talking to agents. We're talking to publicists and managers. And it's really about, you know, get to know us. It's a dating process before we marry. So we, we do do an extensive um, vetting process in where we sit down and we say, here's what UNICEF has to offer. Do any of these things interest you? And then from there, we really build around that. But in the vetting process, usually what works best for us are um, people that are just passionate about children and helping children and sometimes that happens to be people who are parents themselves um, not all the time but a lot of the times and obviously someone who's really going to be committed um, who's going to advocate and fundraise um, for us so there is an extensive we have a criteria that we really follow who's the right brand fit um, for us but really someone who's committed and that who can amplify our message and humanize our voice and how about a care? How do you vet the celebrities you work with? How did you vet Spike? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think... Um, <laughs> By default? Or <laughs> well, I, I think um, there were a couple different things, but the most important thing is the passion for the issue that we're working on. And so we knew that food and nutrition is something that's very close to you, and it made sense. Also, your location in Washington, D.C. Um, I think the trip to Peru was just the beginning of our relationship and what comes after is really where the changes happen and you know I think your proximity to Capitol Hill holds a lot of value in influencing um, the members that we're working with and just having you be able to come up with us to the Hill and talk about your experience, the farmers that you met, the women that you met, um, I think it was really important in that decision and I think there actually doesn't have a very robust celebrity engagement strategy. So I think we're like a lot of nonprofits where it's an area that um, we're working on. So I think with the chefs, it was kind of a different route we took. And what I liked about working with them is that they are very approachable. Um, and they do have the time afterwards to follow up, which is great, um, to do events with us, to advocate with us. And, you know, on the other side, uh, for us, it's, uh, it's a huge learning process for, for you know, most of us chefs that get involved because, you know, we're co so consumed in our uh, daily rituals, which are running restaurants and feeding people and uh, doing a lot more local stuff that, that we often kind of uh, forget or miss out on the opportunities uh, of going abroad and, and uh, you know, seeing uh, what they're doing in different parts of the world uh, with, with, you know, kind of solving, uh, you know, the, the food hunger. Um, so for me, the Peru trip was uh, not only really educational, but it's kind of what made me passionate and inspired. It kind of rekindled this this whole this whole idea for me that that I, I didn't really know was there. So uh, moving forward, it's great because I am on the hill and and uh, you know I've already kind of done a day of lobbying, which was uh, one of my first uh, days, and I I loved it. And it's kind of uh, I get I'm getting addicted to actually uh, working with care. So. Interesting. So getting involved made you want to get more. Yeah, involved. I think I speak on behalf of the you know the chefs that I was on the trip to, which was Victor uh, Albisu and, and um, you know um, Mike Isabella, which uh, are in the same boat. We're we both in, we're all in D.C. We work really hard. We all have our local charities, but this was on, on a bigger scale uh, a scale for us. And uh, being able to take that trip, be on the ground, meet meet the, these people in these villages, uh, you know talk food policy with uh, care activists in Peru uh, and just learn about all this stuff uh, is what really kind of, uh, you know, uh, enabled us to come back to the states with this wealth of information and experience and actually set set the motion forward, you know, well, okay, I went and enjoyed this amazing trip. Uh, for me, it was amazing because it was eye-opening, but I was dealing with, like, the you know, the, the poverty of the country. Uh, and you come back with ideas of how you can help. And, uh, you know, there's one thing sitting in the States and listening to it and reading it and researching about it. It's a completely different thing going to the country, living it, breathing it, and, and experiencing it. And I think that's the key factor, uh, you know, the wow factor for when you kind of take, you know, a pseudo celebrity or whatever over there and, and have them experience it, uh, then it really hits home. So when you come back, you, you really want to do as much as possible to, to kind of. Uh, see that, that whole process through.
And so you worked, you've worked with three charities now. And kind of from your perspective, I know you know you're busy. You're running your businesses. What does the pitch have to be like in terms of? I mean, if you were going to take on another organization that you were going to work with, what what's the things that attract you to an organization when they approach you? Well, you know, uh, I, I I love the um, the thing that really attracts me uh, is is the, the you know the ones that are doing the groundwork. There has to be some groundwork involved. Uh, you know, awareness is 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 amazing and and it, and it's very important. You know. Uh, but I feel that that can only take you so far. So the campaigns for me that that are a little bit more interesting are the ones that that where I can really roll my sleeves up and get involved in the process and learn from it and really and really be able to help. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so those are the ones that are kind of important for me. I, again, I've worked with Horn Kids, uh, which is a a, a local charity, uh, Ward Six. Um, you know, it's mainly about uh, you know taking uh, the kids uh, after school. Uh, and putting into uh, constructive, uh, you know, after-school activities, whether it be painting or playing baseball or cooking or learning about nutrition or whatever it is, keeping them involved instead of them just being back in the neighborhoods enough to no good. So that's an organization that's very close. I got the, you know, they're they're literally five ten minutes away from you know my establishments. I've gone to work with them, you know, very closely over the past couple of years. Um, DC Central Kitchen being a really another great, uh, uh, you know, local. Kind of a charity where you know they're taking ex-cons, putting them through a culinary school program uh, of 18 weeks, and then finding job placements uh, uh, for these individuals, uh, uh, and giving them kind of a second chance at life. You know, through this, through the 18-week school program, they're providing meals for over 3,000 homeless people uh, in the D.C. area. So uh, those have been my two main ones. But um, you know, my first opportunity to work with CARE and, and, and get out of the United States and get a little bit out of my comfort zone in D.C. Um, was really, it was, was truly inspiring. And, and, you know, you can kind of see it now. I've, I've already been on the Hill, like I said, and uh, I'm really enjoying the relationship. So Great, great. And Tamar, do you find that kind of uh, the, the people that you work with, do they really want to do, like, the hands-on travel? Like, sure. Yeah, we um, we do lots of field visits um, with our ambassadors, of course. Like, in order for them to be able to talk about our work, they have to see it firsthand. Um, as I mentioned, we're in 190 countries, so um, you know, not every celebrity travels with us. It is, you know, really selective. It needs to be impactful. We work really closely with that celebrity. Um, of course, like our most well-known celebrities have all really been to the fields. Um, Alyssa Milano and Shakira and you know these are a lot of our Google ambassadors. Um, uh, Lucy Liu has been to the field several times and they go to different places. So they really get to see what different parts of the world are like and what UNICEF work, UNICEF's work looks like on the ground there. Um, so different issues are more prevalent in certain territories and so we again tailor a lot of those trips so that they get to see and experience those things and learn what the solution is. You know, here's the issue and what's the solution. We build a communications plan following that visit so they get to talk about it. They meet with donors. They they you know we highlight it at various events. And it's really again just to build this platform of creating the momentum so that we're putting a lot of these places on the map, you know, what we call silent emergencies. So in certain situations, um, of course, those countries need to be safe places for our celebrities to go and visit. Um, but there are many situations, Syria, for example, now, I mean, we are getting close to that crisis so that the rest of the world and the American public in particular um, can see what's happening there. So we've had several ambassadors who've traveled um, to the refugee camps and, and you know neighboring areas in Lebanon and Jordan so that they get to um, come back and talk about it and help us raise money so we can solve these issues. Great. And Colleen, I had to put your mic on mute um, just because we had some feedback. So if you can unmute yourself, because I have a question from the audience for you specifically. Sure. Um, the, the question is, how do you actually get in touch with a celebrity? Um, Especially if you're not a nationally recognized nonprofit, and and you are, but what's kind of the first step in approaching someone as far as finding out who to talk to to get in touch with them? Yeah, um, so I know at DoSomething.org we take advantage of a couple of resources that aren't that are fairly inexpensive, um, like WhoRepresents.com and IMDb Pro, um, and so those normally cost the subscriptions cost around twenty to fifty dollars a month, I believe, um, and you can it's a database of 
publicists, managers, agents of different talent. Um, so normally, since when a lot of celebrities are working um, with a charity, there's some type of press element. Um, we normally go out to the publicist first. Um, and really, when you're pitching a publicist or a manager or agent, it's really you know kind of showing why it, the celebrity that you're going to work with is a good fit for your organization, what benefits them, and how different ways that they can get involved with different time commitments. Because um, I know a lot of times when we reach out to celebrities, you know, there are a lot who are like, oh, I'd love to do something, I'd love this cause, but filming a movie or, you know, there's only so many different times. So I think one tip to do is definitely make sure you lay out a couple different options with different time commitments as well. Tamar, do you have any advice on that? We have a similar approach um, to Colleen's. I mean, we do work mostly with publicists in terms of initial outreach. There's been so many celebrities who've said, you know, we just want to deal with you directly. This is such an important cause to my heart. Um, and they give us access to that, and they trust us. And, you know, for me, I, I come from the entertainment world, and so it was. it's really relationships. Um, we're really selective. Um, we come up with ideas that, again, really are tailored to that person. So it's about listening to them first, hearing how involved they want to be, how much time they have to dedicate to us. Um, it can be as small or as large scale as it as you know. We need we need all the help we can get, um, and so we we tailor a lot of things around it. But ultimately, um, we work through reps that they help us get answers, schedule things, really move move the needle forward. Um, and so, you know, there are plenty of people we have relationships with directly, but ultimately we work with a, quite a large um, portfolio worldwide. I mean, ours in the U.S., our program in the U.S. is um, really specific to maybe 10 very, very engaged celebrities. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have what, what I like to call the UNICEF family, which is, you know, roster of people that we can call upon to do different things. And it can be from, you know, social media, um, in which case sometimes we just deal with social media managers. Um, it depends on how involved. And then to the, to the end degree, which is, you know, a field visit, and that's at least like a week's time commitment. And how about you? Did you call the restaurant directly, or how did you get in touch with Spike? Um, so I reached out to Spike's publicist, and I want to say that the publicists have been really important in um, helping this relationship grow because, you know, they help us come up with ideas for media outreach. They've helped us with pitching. They've helped us with social media. So I, I definitely think um, it's really great to make them part of the equation and part of the brainstorming process. Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, the, I, 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 you know, more often than not, your publicist or your manager knows the client the best that they're into, and um, you know, like you know, like, like you said, can help kind of roll out some, some specific type of way of, of doing any type of awareness or campaigns or, or what have you. So that really, that at the end of the day, it's really all about the the relationships that you kind of strike, which I think like all these ladies kind of uh, hit on. And this is another question from the group. Um, Specifically for you. And so this is from someone who works at a community hospital, and they're looking for any suggestions to identify celebrities that might be interested in their mission. I mean, you started from a very local place mm -hmm. um, by looking specifically in D.C. Do you have any advice for that person? Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. if you know your mission is health, then think about people in your community that, that might be their passion. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, just really thinking who are those influencers and not just celebrities that are on TV, um, but you know, there's so many other mediums. There's radio, there's in the education space, maybe there's a professor who's really well known and well connected and writes about health issues a lot. Or maybe there is a, a patient whose story is really, really powerful and, um, and they can help speak out on how the hospital has helped provide them with services. So I think thinking outside the box um, really helps because not everyone can get, you know, um, these big celebrities and sometimes it's hard to invest time in managing them. It's a, it's a process and so I think just look around in your neighborhood and look who's um, talking about your issues already. Makes sense. Far, do you have any advice? Um, actually, I was going to add um, to that, but, you know, UNICEF works because we are 
we are across the country in the U.S. Um, we have a lot of local regional offices and we also have a grassroots program with our volunteers. Um, we have global fellows that are placed around the country and also our donors and our donors are, happen to be really important in this equation. Sometimes you know there is someone on our board who is connected to a celebrity, a local celebrity. So when we have regional events um, really opportunities for face-to-face -face communication um, and you know getting to meet and get, uh, get to know that person. I think that is important in, in what Stephanie mentioned you know is that get to know those people that already provide an opportunity for people to have that face-to-face -face communication with you. Those people will rise to the top on how committed they really are. So just organically I think it, it comes to fruition where you get to see like, who's going to be a supporter for your cause. And Colleen, I muted you again, but do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, definitely agree with um, both Stephanie and Laura, you know, really kind of honing in to see um, if there's anyone locally who is passionate about the issue, um, and also kind of thinking outside of the box of traditional celebrity. Um, so kind of like I was saying before earlier, something that is really cool about, you know, being in 2014, the digital age, is there's kind of like these online celebrities who might not be showing up in tabloids, but they also do have a really big influence. Um, so is there someone like that who's really interested in your cause? in your hospital um, or anybody locally who's really well known um, who is also passionate about the issue. And we have a couple other questions. I want to remind you that you can um, either post your question in the box that says Chronicle Live Discussion on the page or using Phil Chat on the uh, on Twitter. Um, a lot of people are posting in the comments and I'm getting those but it's a little bit easier to get through those other boxes. So here's a uh, here's another question from us. A another small organization. As a nonprofit, how do you prove your value to the people you're approaching? So maybe do you have an example of how you kind of proved your value in that initial pitch? Yeah. Um, so if I remember correctly, our first meeting was at your restaurant, your name, yes. um, in person. And um, we brought a book um, that showed what we did on a past trip. And so we let the pictures speak for themselves, and we showed you a sample of kind of what you would see. And um, we just spent that time really getting to know each other and just talking about CARE's work. What is it? You know, um, that we're this organization. We are in more than 80 countries. We reach you know, 122 million people, and we do all kinds of work. But I think where you would fit best is... Um, on the area of food and nutrition and then we kind of delve deeper into that and what that meant and what the policy issues meant to us. Um, so I think just kind of being being able to just have that conversation is really really important and letting the other person you know ask questions about it um, and see where that fit is because it takes time to figure that out and as we were planning the trip and talking about doing videos and social media we started to see more and more alignment on the different issues and we learned a lot of things about your business and your business principles that we were surprised with and we were like that that applies with how care does business too so for instance the emphasis on the small farmer as I learned more about your business that's something that you really value and we were able to show you that in our work our work with smallholder farmers in parts of Peru yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, it's very. I think it's extremely important to be able to to have a human connection when when kind of you're 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 initially kind of you know sourcing out to work with somebody, and uh, for me, kind of that that lunch is kind of what sold it. Just uh, being able to sit across the table, um, being able to take the you know the ten minute, ten fifteen minutes that I did have of my day to kind of just concentrate and uh, go through some of the past programs that they had done, kind of see it, read about it. Um, even ask maybe about you know some different celebrities or different uh, people that that have been on similar trips that you know that I look to as an inspiration so I can kind of make a, a connection with that I think is also important uh, so so for me it, it kind of so, sold itself uh, and again it's very true to what I do uh, every day so uh, the relationship makes sense and um, Colleen is how do you kind of prove your value or kind of do that kind of thing when you're approaching a celebrity? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of what they were both touching on, you know, first you kind of have to put yourself in the publicist or the manager's shoes. Um, you, all day, every day, they're getting so many different requests. So you really have to make sure how is mine going to be specific, how is mine going to be relevant, and why um, should their, the celebrity that they represent um, work with our cause. So um, for Do Something, we try to use you know different examples and really, like they were saying, kind of humanizing what we're doing. Um, so for example, we just wrapped up our seventh annual Teens for Jeans campaign, um, where we work with our postal stores and get young people across the country to donate their gently used jeans at their local store um, to be distributed to homeless youth. Um, so we worked with the girl group Fifth Harmony, who they were finalists on the X Factor and now are touring with Demi Lovato. And they were just so excited by this campaign, first of all, because they're teenagers themselves and the fact that they could help mobilize all their fans to collect jeans for other teenagers was really interesting to them. Um, also because they are, you know, really up and coming and building their fan base, it was really exciting for them to get involved in a cause that not only helps teens but also kind of showcased them them giving back. Um, and also the fact that Do Something reaches so many young people. We have over 2.5 million members that are in their core demo. So making sure that it's specific and what kind of the expectations are and the relevance to that celebrity and humanizing the angle I think is definitely really important. And Tamar, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, you, you know, in our approach um, in speaking with celebrities and or the entertainment industry, you've sort of um, we, we're lucky that we have resources to sort of showcase the work that we're doing. So in the case of, um, you know, we have a meeting with a publicist or the celebrity, we explain to them, you know, here's a case study of a campaign. These are the results. It's billions of impressions. These are the outlets. It's about scale with UNICEF. And because we work at a government level and a local level with NGOs around the world, um, and partnered with them on the ground. We have this approach that's very unique in the industry. So a lot of times we are showcasing here's the impact that you made during an event. We raised 2.8 you know million dollars at this fundraising event, or we got you know two billion media impressions during this campaign. Um, we have some staple campaigns that were synonymous with like trick or treat for UNICEF. And there's a lot of people who remember, you know, recall in the 50s after World War II, sort of trick-or-treating and, you know, what's the um, incentive to sort of still today, you know, collect change that will help kids around the world. It's every little bit counts. So in our approach, we get to really create these resources, um, sizzle reels after, after an event or case studies that, um, or impact reports that we get to show um, the results of, you know, Lenny Kravitz participating in our tap campaign UNICEF TAP project a couple of years ago was really groundbreaking for us in terms of um, results, in terms of the actions that people really participated. I mean, our volunteers uh, network sort of exploded. And so in those, in those moments, um, we get to say, we get to do this with you. You know, what speaks to you? What's your unique strength? Is it social media? You know, is it face-to-face -face interaction with donors? Um, so the results and the scale can be great and impactful. And here's another question um, from the audience about compensation. Is, is compensating a celebrity worth it? Um, is that expected? Should you run away when, you, when someone asks for compensation? How do you deal with that kind of thing? Tomorrow, I think I'll start with you. We do not compensate. We do not pay fees. Our celebrity family, um, they're volunteers. They come to us. They, I don't think they expect it. I think they expect expenses to be covered. Um, you know, again, if you are performing at our gala, that's, you know, several thousand dollars just to have you show up. But, it, you know, UNICEF has a very strict policy about how much money we give back to the field and how much is an overhead. So it's a very, very small margin. Um, we do not pay appearance fees for celebrities to show up to events. I think it sets a precedent. Again, it is a UNICEF policy. Um, I personally and ethically agree with it, um, and it has certainly proven that you get really at the heart um, of people who are committed for different reasons, not because you know they're going to get a, a paycheck from a nonprofit. I don't think that that has ever been an incentive that sits well with them. Colleen, how about you? 
Um, same exact thing with do something.org. We never compensate our celebrities. Um, if there are expenses, you know, travel, things like that, um, we will work with their team to see what we can cover. But they really are volunteers and really are ambassadors, which, like Laura was saying, is also really shows that they're really invested in the cause and really invested in the impact that they're going to create, which is kind of what we're looking for. And it's we try to make it as mutually beneficial as possible. And Stephanie, you don't... You don't compensate? No, I think I agree with um, both Tamara and Colleen. Um, we find people who want to do this, and they're advocates for us. They're champions for us. Mm -hmm. um, so a question, another question for you, Spike. Has there ever been a nonprofit that approached you and partnered to partner or promote anything that you said no to? Um... Well, I mean, you know, as a you know part of the part of the game these days, uh, being you know this this like, massive food industry boom that we've had, uh, you know, it's really put uh, a lot of chefs on the forefront of uh, of the industry in, in many different ways, and we're always getting asked to go to uh, certain festivals these year, uh, you know, or certain you know get involved with a million things, um, you know. The thing is, we have businesses to run ourselves, and it's not that uh, you know, you know, uh, one campaign is better than the other, or or, or things like that, or, or you know, preferences. It's just that we don't have an, enough time. So I feel, you know, being smart about it as um, you know, you know, a, a celebrity is is kind of choosing what's close to your heart, uh, what makes sense, what kind of relationship makes sense to you uh, to to kind of approach. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it's not really the, the best idea to kind of have something that's too far-fetched from what you're doing, uh, in, you know, in your real life or business, because that you, you can't really kind of humanize it yourself. You don't even understand it. I mean, yes, it's a great cause, and, and you want to be able to help, but sometimes the opportunities just don't make exact sense uh, for you. So I think you're doing them more of a disservice uh, on, on taking that opportunity if it's if it's something you know, you're not really truly passionate about. Uh, again, there's a lot of people out there and a, a lot of advocacy uh, to be had. Uh, you know, the right relationship that makes sense, I think, are the ones that are going to be long lasting uh, and are going to have uh, the biggest impact. So, um, you know, I, I've definitely said no to 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 a bunch of things. Uh, but as you can see, like Horns Kids and, and DC Central Kitchen have, have been uh, ones that I said yes to, and, and I've been dedicated for uh, for years now since mm -hmm. I've, I've been in the DC area. And you know, I look look forward to having that relationship with Care also. So uh, I think you know, uh, if you know, you're a celebrity out there looking to do advocacy, I think it's very important that you you specifically kind of navigate on what is you can have your biggest effect on. Um. And thinking about, so I, I saw recently from your trip, you have a lot of video clips and that kind of thing. How are you maybe talking a little bit about the strategy of, you know, so you went on this trip, now you have all this other media. How are you going to use that now? Like, what are the things that you want to collect when you're out in the field to yeah. come back and then promote with? Yeah, um, so on our trip we brought a videographer and a photographer to document it, and we knew that these guys had been on TV before, and so we wanted to capture those moments of them just learning and letting the audience learn with them. And so the first episode of this mini-series we did actually released yesterday on care.org. And, um, you know, we, we just went into the field and shot as much as we could and then looked at the footage when we got back. And, and we saw that we had enough to focus on each of the chefs, um, a part of their experience. So for Spike, it was hanging out with the potato farmer. With Mike, it was cooking the guinea pig. Um, and we're rolling it out on our website and we're using social media to um, amplify the reach of the video. We're also pitching the video to different blogs, to different Twitter influencers, just trying to get the word out there. And it's a more fun and engaging way to learn about our issues, um, rather than the traditional, very serious NGO video. And I think social media played a huge part of the trip. So from the start, um, we created a social media guide with certain hashtags and certain handles. And we had the chefs tweeting days before the trip and throughout the trip because we wanted it to be a live process that people could follow that journey. Yeah. And Spike, I don't know if you want to talk more yeah, about I mean, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you nailed it on what you said. I think, you know, 
uh, this day and age, uh, um, you know, it's really important you, you kind of hit all the, uh, the points of uh, the social networking opportunities that you have, uh, the opportunities that, you know, we, we definitely live in, 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 a, in a world now that everyone has, a, you know, that phone in, the, in their hands and, and everyone's kind of on Twitter and Instagram and, and uh, people love, you know, uh, getting the message delivered by a, a fun, cool, uh, cool clip on a, on, on a video. So I think the way of doing advocacy and, and uh, tackling it is always constantly develop is developing and um, you know I think the the care campaign was uh you know one of my first ones uh, that was that interesting and, and you know had a lot of those different aspects a lot of the photography the videography the social media involved the build up the actual trip coming back and in kind of a you know um, you know kind of taking the next step and, and kind of sharing your experiences with with the world and who you can. Uh, you know, doing a little bit more of the traditional stuff. You know, going on the hill and lobbying, meeting meeting those congressmen and, and, and senators. Uh, so, uh, the full package I feel is kind of a, kind of what we did on this last Peru trip, and uh, I thought it was great. So, and just to add to that, when we went back, we also engaged traditional media. So that was a big part of it. Um, Spike just did a piece on um, USA Today. Um, yes. Asha Gomez, our fantastic chef out of Atlanta, did a lot of local media segments to tell the story to the Atlanta community. And I think what was great about working with chefs is for the first time we could reach out to a lot of different beat reporters that we can't always reach out to because we had a different person telling the story now. And so I thought that was really um, useful. And I think media has to continue playing a big role in our relationship with them. We have to continue showcasing the things we do um, because they get different people to listen. They reach new audiences that we haven't reached yet. So. Yes, that's uh, and that's a really interesting point about the media because you know one of the things that we think about a lot here is you know local media doesn't necessarily cover nonprofits a lot. Right. So if you can find an angle to get in the style section or the food section mm -hmm. or something, that's um, major or smart. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tamar, as far as trips into the field, what are the kind of uh, things that you collect there and then come back and kind of repackage and do you have kind of a similar social media setup with your ambassadors? We do. Um, you know, we view field visits as a fact-finding mission. Um, you know, occasionally when it's the right person and the right opportunity, media may travel, um, you know, with an ambassador to see programs, but for the most part, they are fact-finding missions. They are documented um, with photographers and videographers um, that travel along with us most of the time locally. We hire them locally. Um, and, you know, UNICEF has really specific guidelines on how we film um, children. Um, so there is a real opportunity to get this interaction of that celebrity learning, um, getting to meet and hear the stories of the children and the families. We come back, we build, usually the communications plan is built prior, so when we get that itinerary and we know exactly what they're going to see. Um, we try and create some unique out-of-the-box things that that celebrity can own. So whether that's a social media campaign that involves various call to actions when we turn from that visit, um, sometimes that's the case. Uh, it Again, it's, it's social media, it's traditional media, um, but usually there is also a fundraising activity that will follow that's really important for us. So it's the action, but it's the solution, and we get the solution by raising the dollars. And is there is there a noticeable effect on the fundraising um, with using a celebrity? There is. Sometimes it depends on the celebrity. I mean, Selena Gomez is a great example of someone who just happens to engage with brilliantly. You know, whatever she does, they listen. And so sometimes you see, depending on who that celebrity is, um, there's a spike in fundraising or there's a spike in activity. And that can be in social media. It can be an online conversation. Um, so it really depends on who that person is. And based on their strengths and really who their audience is, um, we build the communications plan around that. So sometimes it's heavier on traditional media, heavier on, you know, come back and do a speaker series around the country where you get to talk about your experience or, you know, be an MC or a keynote at our event. Um, and then other times it's, we just need you pushing this out in social. We need you doing media and talking about it. Um, you know, hard-hitting news, entertainment type press, and it really runs the gamut. We have a stellar PR team here that helps us with that. 
And Colleen, what are some of the communication plans that, that you put together around celebrity engagements? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, with Do Something, you know, we're not really as on the ground, um, you know, in different countries, kind of like CARE and UNICEF. But we, what we do um, do really well is, you know, we're able to engage our celebrities and kind of have them participate in a lot of the campaigns that they support. Um, so, for example, for the Teens for Jeans campaign that I was talking about earlier, um, we had a, a few different celebrity supporters who actually donated their own jeans at their local Aeropostale store. Um, and they were able to take videos, um, and take pictures as well that we were able to pitch out to different teen entertainment lifestyle outlets. Um, we actually worked with Sinead Grimes, um, who did a Teens for Jeans drop-off in Canada this year, and it was really great because she was so excited to be in her hometown in Toronto and, you know, tell everyone, hey, I'm in my local Aeropostale store dropping off my jeans, you should do it too. Um, and when we're making these different communications plans, you know, it's really kind of dependent on what the campaign is um, and what we're trying to get young people to do. So some of our campaigns, like the Teens for Jeans ones, um, really has more of an offline element where you have to physically go into a store and donate your jeans. Um, we run a couple other campaigns that can be done digitally. Um, so we know that young people are glued to their cell phones and that SMS text messaging is actually one of the best ways to reach young people. Um, so some of our campaigns are almost entirely text message focused. Um, we actually just launched a campaign today, it's the third year, called the Pregnancy Text, where it's our um, teen pregnancy campaign and it kind of puts a modern twist on the egg baby and you get text messages for 12 hours from a virtual baby. Um, and last year, Snooki was the face of that campaign because she had just had a baby and it was something that she was able to talk about um, from the heart and everything. So when we're making different communications plans, it kind of depends on what the involvement looks like and what the campaign looks like by always trying to, you know, like they were both saying, maximize how we can kind of reach out to press, which original assets can we get, whether it's through social media or is it a photo or is it them taking a selfie um, and something that we can pitch out and really show that they're giving back and invested in the cause. Great. Um. And kind of on the fundraising point, are there any fundraising activities that you're doing together now that the, the trip is over? I mean, we've 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 chatted about doing a couple uh, fundraising dinners. Uh, all three chefs, you know, we all have restaurants and, and, and spaces, so we, we've definitely uh, discussed it. We we haven't done that quite yet, though. Yeah, I think um, it's all part of the plan over this next year. Um, but one thing that um, we are doing with fundraising is Asha Gomez is participating um, in this challenge with us with Live Below the Line, which is where you live under a dollar fifty a day. So she is getting a group of friends, possibly other chefs together in Atlanta to participate on it. So we're finding ways to engage them with fundraising efforts. Um, but we um, there's still a lot of planning to be done. Yeah, I mean we literally just got back from the trip, so we're trying to roll out, you know, uh, you know what the experience was through the trip, and I'm sure we'll we'll get into that and stuff. So. Cool. There will be great food. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, as far as looking ahead at um, kind of the year ahead, and you know, this relationship, obviously, you both really enjoy working on this project together. Is there anything formal, like a contract at all, between you to work together? in the year ahead? Or I, is that something that you've drawn up before? Um, I think that's something CARE is still trying to figure out what our exact approach is. And I think for now, um, we plan on continuing to work together on these different projects when they're the right fit. So and it's, it's an open um, communications process. If Spike's got an idea, he pitches it to us. If yeah. we've got something, We'll pitch it to him. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure how some of the rest of the the you know um, that if they do it with a contract or anything, but I mean, I, I would assume maybe a contract would probably get in the way a little bit because it, it you know you, you want to be able to have like you said you want to have that open line of conversation and inspiration and you know bounce back ideas and and you know I don't think you need something so you know standard to kind of yeah. follow it and, and and to be able to execute your relationship yeah. with someone. I think. You know, by being friends and enjoying enjoying the cause and doing it, I think it is far better than any type of contract you can yeah. draw up. You don't need a legal document. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need a lot of legal documents for this one. Is uh, do you have a legal document for? Do you have any contract with your ambassadors? We have what we call a good faith agreement, 
right. you know, and that's so again, just to engage with celebrities, no, there is it is a relationship. It's mutually beneficial. You know, you tell us what you want to do, we tell you what we need. Um, but when it gets more formal, where there is a title involved, because of the history with UNICEF, you know, it's not something we give out lightly. Um, it is a real commitment to the organization. So I, I use what we call a good faith agreement, which basically outlines like it's our responsibility to show you our work. It's our responsibility to educate you. And then it's your responsibility to in turn help us with what our goals are. So of course it's more of, you know, an understanding. This is this is what we expect from the relationship. We dedicate um, certainly a lot of time and effort, you know, it's why I have a job. <laughs> um, and so because of that, I think it's um, important that there is an understanding of, you know, when, when somebody agrees to uh, perform at an event, unless something really prohibits them from being there, we expect them to be there. They're usually on the invitation. They've certainly helped us sell tickets and tables. And so, you know, everyone's schedule gets in the, you know, can get in the way. It's, it's possible, but certainly we do expect that if you commit to this organization, there's going to be hundreds of people that are relying on you, thousands in some cases. How about you, Colleen? Is it all good faith? Yeah, for the most part, you know, like they were both saying, it's really all about the relationships and all about really communicating kind of what's expected from both parties. Um, so we always kind of, after we have a meeting or a call or agree to work with a certain celebrity, make sure that we kind of draft up here are the expectations from do something. This is what we're going to make sure that we do from our side and also the clear expectations for the talent. So nothing extremely formal, but just kind of clear, especially when there's a lot of different kind of cooks in the kitchen and different people from each team on the talents team and also on the organization's team, just so everybody is kind of in the loop and knows what's expected from both parties. But I mean, when we do trust the talent that we work with that they're going to uphold what they said they were going to do. So it's more of just something to kind of look at and be like, this is our partnership outline. This is what we both agreed that we would do, but not super formal. Mm -hmm. Um, and Colleen, while you're up, as, have there been any pitfalls of working with celebrities? Have you run into any problems? Not to mention names, but have there been any like issues that are, are common or that you've run into before? Um, I can't think of anything specifically. I think the one kind of down, the only thing with you know working with talent is just the crazy schedules. You know, it's celebrities are so busy and they normally have so many different projects that they're working on. Um, so timing and scheduling, I feel like normally is kind of one of the biggest hurdles to overcome, um, especially when working with, you know, new talent who you're just kind of introducing to your organization and trying to, you know, kind of get your foot into the door. Um, or, you know, kind of how Spike was saying, how we can't say yes to everyone. You know, you only have so much time, you only have so many resources, and you want to make sure what you're doing matters. So I think um, just trying to kind of get over that hurdle, but nothing, I can't think of a specific example. <laughs> Are there any pitfalls that you've run into? I wouldn't call it a pitfall per se, but I do think this is important just for, for every organization. You know, when we work with celebrities, I sort of say, you know, up front that UNICEF be the, like if you're going to have a title with us as an ambassador, that you work with us exclusively as the children's humanitarian organization. So, you know, again, it's just not to dilute our message. Our message has to be out there loud and proud. So it, we're lucky it just hasn't happened to us. And I think because of our close relationships with the talent we work with, they're really open to say, you know what, I got asked to do this. Is it okay? You know, is it a conflict? And we'll be really honest with them. The, the only other thing I would mention is, you know, everyone has a personal life, and sometimes those celebrities just unfortunately theirs are in the spotlight and ours are not. And so it is always about being really honest of when you just need to sort of quietly take a break for a couple weeks. You know, I think that that's fair, and I think most people that we work with understand that. It's lucky for us, it really hasn't happened, but I think that is something that we work for our organizations respectively and we have to protect them and so sometimes you just need to separate the artist from your organization and their whatever's happening um, that would be the only comment and sort of um, thing that I think is important to note for people it looks like we have about five minutes left so um, I guess it's time for any final advice Stephanie Spike do you have anything 
about your partnership? Any advice for other organizations trying to do something similar? You know, I, I, I just, uh, you know, again, I, I'd love to work with all these organizations, and, and uh, you know, I, I truly believe it's, a, it's an honor to be part of, of, of CARE and to be asked to work with them. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for that. You know, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I guess for this, you know, the, uh, the smaller uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, fundraisers out there that are looking to kind of just you know grow bigger and and strike those relationships is uh, you know I think there's a lot of creative uh, ways that you can you can fundraise and and uh, I think those are the ones that are really attractive these days uh, and to keep pushing them I mean I was literally on the UNICEF app uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, uh, you know I was staying off my phone and and, and uh, ra raising money for uh, uh, you know a day of water for for people so you know cool programs like that that are amazing I have friends that throw this great global uh, citizens festival in New York it's a concert uh, that they throw once a year in, in the park and you can only get tickets if you do philanthropic uh, duties throughout the year and you earn points to get a ticket to this big show so you get people involved so I think you know go big think creative you don't always have to rely on celebrities. Uh, you know, uh, gathering just your, the local masses can also be really, really, uh, really great. And um, you know, do something that you're really passionate about. So, great. I think just to echo that, you know, I think think outside the box when you have that definition of a celebrity. It may not be who you see in the magazines, but there are people out there who are passionate about your issues, who have a lot of influence and who really want to learn about it and learn what they can do about it for your organization. Great. Colleen? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just to echo off kind of what everyone has said, you know, first really making sure that you're building these relationships and making sure that the celebrity kind of really knows what they're getting into, what the impact is, and how their support really matters. Um, and then also, too, thinking outside the box, the uh, different people that might not fall into the traditional celebrity, um, you know, maybe up and coming celebrities are always great to work with and actually might be more beneficial for you because they have more time um, and can be a little bit more invested in the cause and will remember you if they do get bigger. Um, and also just to, you know, think outside the box and think of ways that you can get celebrities involved to make the most impact. And Tamar? Um, I would just add that um, really look to your networks. I think there are gems that are in there. Um, we have a UNICEF Next Generation group that's a young, rapid group of really influential people in their own right. Um, they may not be traditional celebrities, but they have brought in um, money for us. They have made huge impact. They have helped us spread the word. And, you know, within that have been people that have, again, like risen to the top and um, become champions for us. So I think in your own networks, whether that be individual donors, volunteers for your organization, that's where you can kind of build a small army of supporters. That's important. Great. Thank you. It looks like our uh, hour is up. A big thanks to Spike and Stephanie and Tamara and Colleen. We really appreciate all of your time. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined the conversation today. If you'd like to review this session, a recording will be available immediately, and we'll be sharing it out over the next few days on philanthropy.com, on YouTube, and on Google+. Uh, next week's free live discussion will be on how to streamline donation pages to make giving simple and fast for your donors, and that will be at noon Eastern time on Tuesday. Um, also, you may be interested in our monthly premium webinar series. It offers training in fundraising, social media, and grant seeking. I'll be hosting our next session about uh, getting the most from your social media followers with two very different and very interesting groups, the Veterans uh, Disaster Relief Organization, Team Rubicon, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, which is a great combination. Uh, if you want to attend that session, we're offering a special discount to people who attended this discussion and other discussions. Uh, use code CHAT15 to get 15% off, and that's at philanthropy.com slash webinars. Uh, again, thanks to our guests and to everyone else who joined us today. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.